That's right, the OG nerds. Uh huh. My name is Trey. Oh yeah. How are you feeling, Nathan? So great. Oh, good. It's a good track. I know. Well, we've been looking for a reason to play Trey's new song. Trey, from every day Sunday, his first single, like solo. And if you if this is your first episode listening to the podcast, you should all go back out and just l- listen to the back back ones where Trey tells he comes on the first time uh, at Wild Goose a couple years ago when we were at the Wild Goose Festival, which is like the premier spirituality, music, and arts festival in North Kakalak each summer for progressive Christians. He was there and um, he came on and talked about being a like not fundamentalist and uh in contemporary Christian music industry thing. And and then he started hanging out with goose people. And I think we corrupted <laughs> he him. He got goosed. Yeah, he got goosed. And then he just wanted to hang out and have fun. He came to progressive youth ministry and all that kind of stuff. And then a little over a year ago, he came out. Um, right when that happened, we had a podcast episode where he kind of shared that process and stuff. And since then, he's been working on new music. And that was the first single, um, which if you have like, you know, the internet, you can go find it on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, all those places it's called silver horizon. I thought there's a high likelihood you will, you will dance and the song will remain in your head. Yeah. I haven't got it out of my head since I heard it. It's so catchy. It's yeah. so good. And, uh, it's, it's great. So yeah, Trey, what's up now? Theology nerds, this special edition, this is like a Q and a edition where people send in topics and junks mm-hmm. and we're going to talk about it. So just prepare yourself. Uh, and as we, as we, as we go in, we want to give a shout out. To the one and the only, Charlie. The Charlie. Go- the godfather. The godfather of homebrewed Christianity. He is a, uh, a member of the homebrewed community. That means he's one of the people that donate each month to keep the podcast coming. And you, of course, uh, have uh, every opportunity to join the homebrewed community. Yeah, you're, you're doing that right now, right? You're, just, you're stopping whatever you're doing to go <laughs> donate right now. And, and go to homebrewedcommunity.com. Uh, you can join the secret Facebook group, give all sorts of input, uh, send in questions like these. Uh, to be on future podcasts and, uh, you know, get furthest access to all sorts of excitement. Like the LGBT camp? Ooh, yeah, that's correct. Uh, but this week we're going to talk about um, uh, how absolutely never you should preach the woman at the well story in the Gospel of John. <sighs> since since you've already done that, then we should, we're going to tell you what you shouldn't have done. Yeah. yeah this we, is the perfect time. We're going to shame day. people yeah. the week after it was in the <laughs> liturgical calendar. Um but this, we've been talking about it this week at the hatchery because we have a little uh, lectionary group. Mm-hmm. And then I, I got really upset with <laughs> the sermons that others that were there have, have heard about the text. Uh, then we're going to talk about uh, Jill Ann left a message from some of her friends at Wesley Theological Seminary in D.C. about musical theater. She's like, you mentioned you're a musical theater nerd. And I said, yes. <laughs> and she has a, a really sweet musical theater question. Which Can't um, wait. I know you've played... Music, I, yes, for I, 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 have, I have been in the pit for countless musicals. Oh, you've been in the pit. I've been in the pit. Is this like an introduction to a lamentation song? It or? is indeed. <laughs> I tell you what, nobody appreciates those in the pit during the musical. But well, I tell you what, if you're not there, you notice. Well, God, I want you to know that Jesus is with you in the pit. Um, <laughs> and then uh, Nathan, Nathan has some. He apparently has some ways he plans on connecting Peter Burgers. Uh, Sacred Canopy, which is a book we've recently read uh, at the Hatchery in the, the the kind of theories of religion class to Donald Trump. Now, I have no idea. Uh, is it, we're going to see what happens. But we'll at least talk about Peter, Peter Berger, mm-hmm. Sacred Canopy. Mm-hmm. Um, but first, we have something for you called a message from the Godfather. Hey, Trip. Hope hey, Charlie. This is Charlie in Oklahoma City. Man, I'm really looking forward to Theology Beer Camp. Me too. Here in OKC. Totally looking forward to it. In the month of August. Correct, Amundo. Yes. It's hot here. Mm-hmm. Yes, we will survive. I and believe Yes, it. we will have cold, zesty beverages. Mm. Oh, of yeah. Of the hop variety. Of the barrel-aged variety. For My favorite. high gravity. Excellent. Needs. And... Even a little bit lighter variety, lighter ones for session know. time. Well, it seems like a great, great collection. See you all soon. Oh, I can't wait to see you, Charlie. That, my friends, is the one and only Godfather, Charlie Sheldon. And um, I just want you to know, there's only one way, one way that you call 
that chill, that legit, and leave a message on the speak pipe because you're the freaking godfather. So cool. Oh yeah. So uh, I don't. I don't know, Ryan. I think we'll stay cool in Oklahoma City just by hanging with Charlie. Yeah, he's so cool. It'll mm-hmm. just like it'll be like fifteen degrees colder near him. So if you haven't got your tickets to Theology Beer Camp, do it. Uh, theologybeercamp dot com. Uh, if it's before the end of the month of March, that's when the early bird tickets end. That's right. So you hurry, hop on that. And if uh, it, remember, it's also in. Uh, it's a good beer pun. I know. <laughs> It'll also be in Denver the week before. Peter Rollins is joining. It's going to be exciting. So Nathan, why not? Why why don't you set this up? Because you were the one who got me riled up in the middle of text group at the hatchery. So on Tuesdays, which is like Nerd Day, um, we were breakfast day. We were just having some some wonderful breakfast. Nathan is a master of the griddle. This is true. We are making some omelets, got some garlic bread, some hash browns. Oh, and breakfast is all rocking up. And now we're like, let's let's read our liturgical text for the week and discuss. And I was not expecting my blood pressure to get high and have strong hatred towards plenty of other ministers. So uh, for those of you that don't know the story, um, this is where Jesus in the Gospel of John is visiting Samaria at Jacob's well. And he gets there, Samaritan woman. Goes to draw water. Jesus says, can you give me a drink? The disciples are off in the city buying food. And, um, you know, uh, the Samaritan woman's like, why are you asking me? I'm a woman. I'm Samaritan. You're Jewish. That's that's just bad. And he's like, if you knew the gift of God that I'm bringing, then you'd be down. And then he's like, I'm living water. And she's like, you don't know who I am. And he's like, I know. Why don't you go get your husband? Oh, you don't have one. You had, you've had five. Um, and you know, it gets this whole, they go back and forth, back and forth. And then you know, we're going to worship God in spirit and truth later. Uh, we don't have to pick mountains, yeah, religious mountain. mountains for battles. And, I, and, and then she's like, she's like down. She goes she and tells, tells her friends. Everyone. Yeah. And she comes back. But, uh, I I didn't realize this story was a story for basically sex shaming. That was not the yeah. Well, sex shaming as a gateway, a gateway into just shaming everyone. Yeah, I for mean, all sorts of things. I mean, there's a a, a plethora of of shamies. Yes, yeah. So I I mean I, I remember hearing this a uh, number of times, and especially uh, you know emphasized uh, is a. Uh, by the way, this is John 4, just in case you are really wanting to follow along at home. Uh, this is the part where uh, Jesus says, go and get your husband and mm-hmm. come back. And she's like, I don't have any husband. And he's like, you're right. You're right. I know that. Because you've had five. And now the one you have is not your husband. And uh, the woman's like, oh, you're, you must be a prophet. Like, how else could you have known that? And so the way that that's usually the part that's emphasized when mm-hmm. I've heard this text preached in, in uh, some past lives. And... Um, as a person that went to a church that was slightly more conservative or evangelical. Uh, and like the point is Jesus knows your secrets. Oh yeah. You know, like he knows all the bad things that you're ashamed of as a person and you can't hide it from him. You can't hide it. He's going to know you. You want to be like trying to keep secrets from him. No, that's not going to work. Yeah. He's going to find out. And so you should feel bad about hiding your secrets from Jesus. So base, basically, there's like, you can't block your soul's IP address. No, you cannot. No, he can he can find it. And he'll know all the things you're looking all at. All those cookies. <laughs> all those sin cookies. It doesn't matter if you clear your search history. He's going to know. He's going to find it. You know, there's only one person that can clear your search history. <laughs> we should do like a, like a an atonement theory based on internet <laughs> Anyway, um, browsing habits, browsing habits. So, um, and, 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 and here's the thing that I kind of, I'm surprised you'd never heard that. Well, I mean, I could, I hadn't, one of the things that happens is if you're a preacher's kid is that you involuntarily hear the same preacher preach all the time or people that they, uh, would work with or go to church with or invite into their pulpit. So I really missed out on like some ways of ruining really cool text. Mm. So the, the the interesting thing to me about this text is it's kind of the opposite. 
of that. <laughs> uh, and, and part of it might just be that people love to read the Bible and not realize it's old. Um, but if we think of the historical context, like a, a woman doesn't have the ability to get divorced. Only a man does. They were, they were, they were settled in property rights rules and you could just divorce because of burnt toast, like let alone anything bad. And so when you hear of a female in the first century who has had five previous marriages and is shacking up with someone, then you are hearing the description of someone who is socio-culturally and economically oppressed and that this person has entered into uh, a, a agreements where the man walked out or died, which I guess is one option, which then I guess the brother didn't mm-hmm. step up or whatever. But I mean, it, the, the highest likelihood historically is that this is a female who, who maybe is barren or something. And the guy's just like no basket, no kids, yeah. no chance yeah. and pushes her out multiple times. Um, in, in, in whatever way she could even be complicit in it, this, like, Jesus's encounter is not like you're bad because you divorced somebody. Yeah. It's, yeah, like, this is part of our system, our reality of our world. Um, you, like, she's going to be carrying shame for that, not right, guilt. Right. Right. And I think that is such a problem. When people take a story, when you're like, oh, well, Jesus knows everything, you should feel really guilty. But she doesn't have the ability to initiate divorce. Mm-hmm. Like, so if the divorce is the sin, then she didn't do it. Yeah. Um, and she's a victim of multiple men walking out. Now, does that mean that there can't be all sorts of reasons that someone enters bad relationships and continually is hurt? Yeah, there's pro- that's probably true. And we all do that all the time. Surprisingly, we put ourselves in situations where we continually get hurt by making ourselves vulnerable to the same type of people that hurt us the same way. That's like, what human being like that's our problem but that's not the point here at all the the point is that her in the shame she carries as a victim in all the ways that she tries to cover it up would never bring it jesus brings it to the surface because it's clarity and honesty about her reality which that's the very place new life becomes possible mm-hmm. and so the, if if this text is going to be setting up a salvation story, uh, an encounter with the eternal water, eternal life, as uh, as it's described, or the possibility of worshiping in spirit and in truth, then it's one where shame doesn't keep you uh, from naming uh, the reality of your situation. And I, I couldn't imagine sitting in a congregation hearing this text spoke and, and thinking like, you know what Jesus only wants you to do right now? You need to bring the word. So that everyone else who has secrets in here, they don't want to let out because they don't know if they could belong if they let the uh, the truth come out. Or those that know, everyone knows about their business because they happen to have junk that can't get hidden the same way. That They need to know. Jesus knows it. Even mm-hmm. if we're not acknowledging mm-hmm. it, we want you to know. Jesus knows and we know, so you're judged. Like, that's the opposite. Right. right. Uh, I, it, it is just beyond frustrating to me. And I just, I, I know someone probably heard that text preached this week after hearing multiple students talk about this. Jesus's story is, oh, do male and female, is this going to keep us apart? No. Oh, religious difference, Jew, Samaritan, is this going to keep us apart? No. Where we worship going to keep us apart? No. The actual reality of our lives, is that going to keep us apart? Because this woman has been forsaken by multiple men. And is now trying to avoid probably like prostitution or any other mm-hmm. thing that you get forced into sociologically in this condition by, you know, quote, shacking up mm-hmm. with somebody. Then uh, and he's like, I know that. And yet I'm going to offer you living water. Yeah, that's awesome. Like that should be good news. To anybody. It should give you permission that your faith community is the place where you get to be honest about reality. If nowhere else. Right. And at the end of the story, like she is the one. That is responsible for you know, sharing that living water with a whole group of people. Yeah, which which is, I mean, odd in the sense that um, a Samaritan woman facilitates a little mini revival in Samaria before the disciples accomplish anything. Because this is chapter four in the Gospel of John. Jesus um, and, and the disciples in this story are idiots. Like, the, like if you were trying to draw a contrast. Like they show back up, you know, and Jesus is, you know, hanging out 
with this uh, female. And the text just said, just then the disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? So like the gospel, John's like the disciples showed back up and they thought in their heads, everything, the shitty version of the sermon thought, yep. why is he with her? Blah, 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 blah. And it's only in there. So, you know, they're wrong. Like the whole book. This, they're wrong a lot. I know, but that's, <laughs> it's, it's a pedagogical thing. Like they're, they're dimwits. So you don't have to go slap your minister for preaching a bad sermon. You just kind of point out that um, the disciples were thinking that they kept it to themselves. Here's one of the good things to know they kept themselves. They kept it to themselves because they probably knew what Jesus' response was mm-hmm. going to be. Well, I guess that's a sign of encouragement. Yeah, they were making baby steps. Yeah, yeah. They were making baby steps. Um, and and so then when you get when when you get to that uh Jesus, you know, going to the uh to the to the disciples after it, and he says, My food is to do the will of him who sent me to complete his work. Do not say four months more, then comes the harvest. But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reapers already receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. And like that text is one saying eternal life is something that's available to people now. And like your job is to go do it. And it's saying like you don't have a monopoly. Mm -hmm. You're going out. Junk's already growing. Like you don't get to like you don't show up and God shows up. God's already present wanting to bring uh, life into being, fruit into being. And that's your job. So I know what you were thinking a minute ago. Stop thinking that. (laughs) Like you don't think. You show up like I don't know why he's doing this. This is like like not high quality messiahship. What's Jesus thinking? (laughs) (laughs) But. One of my other favorite parts is, well, you know, the other one of the other texts for last week, I guess, was Exodus seventeen, and you know, uh, they're uh, testing and quarreling with the Lord and Moses. Is like, oh, what you know, what what am I going to do with these people? They're going to like stone me. You know what? I, you know, I don't understand. Give them some water. Yeah, give them some water, and You're everything thirsty. will be okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so when you read these two together, it seems clear to me at least that the Samaritan woman is the Moses figure mm-hmm. in, and that's pretty sweet that a, a yeah, woman yeah. and a Samaritan woman is playing the role of, of Moses. So in the Exodus text, you have like thirsty people in the desert and they're like, Hey, we had water in Egypt <laughs> <laughs> just already, already starting to complain. Yep. And then Moses is like, God, I'm like, can't you just, can't you hook us up with some liquid? Come on. And, 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 uh, and God's like, you can, you can use your stick, which you got to think like, if you parted the Red Sea, wouldn't you have tried the stick thing? I don't, I don't think it was on. I think if there was a flip uh, of switch, the batteries are dead. God had to, God had to update yeah. the stick because if you parted waters with it already, I would start whacking stuff, <laughs> hoping that water comes up. And if not, you know, so they should have given instructions. That's what it, that's what he needed. Maybe they were on the backside of the first set of the Ten Commandments. Mm. They got broke. So that's what it and God's like, you you missed out the instructions for the stick. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> that must have been it. But yeah, so you know, um, I just want you all to know that this has really been bothering him. It has, and if if you hear the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. Then she is the first successful missionary. Mm. Uh, she's also a Samaritan. And the context for her encounter with eternal life and uh, the motivation for her movement to testify to this reality was permission to be fully honest and open about the reality of her situation as a victim, an oppressed woman in a patriarchal society that was religiously sanctioned patriarchy. And in the midst of that, Jesus is like, here's the living water, and it's for you. And the disciples are still complaining about it. She got it first. She shared it first. And she shared it and believed it and tasted it and knew it was good because she met Christ, and that created the opportunity to be honest about the shame and burden she carries. And if you preach a text like that and do the opposite with it, you killed the Holy Spirit. That's how you ruin <laughs> – you just ruin the text that way. And so uh, – So don't suck. <laughs> I guess that's um, um, <laughs> one way of putting it. That's one way of putting it. 
Uh, but yeah. So any, uh, well, isn't this also, uh, one of the only places where it, it explicitly says what God is? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it says God is spirit. Yeah. And there's only like three of them in the Bible. God is spirit. God is love. God is truth. Everything else is not really direct. Mm-hmm. So, you know, just important to note, you know? Oh yeah. I mean, I know, I know like as a theologian, I figure those are like, those are three solids. Pretty re- reliable. You know what I mean? <laughs> like if, if you're like, well, you know, as a biblical Christian, there's only like three direct essence statements about God and it's spirit, truth, and love. Uh, seem uh, Those seem pretty legit. And actually, I think like if you have two of the three without the other, then it goes bad. Mm. So y'all think on that. Um, <laughs> that correlates Sounds to familiar. different early church heresies. I don't know. Yeah. But, you know. That's for another episode. Uh, <laughs> That'd be a fun episode, actually. <laughs> well, <laughs> all right. So now we're going to hear from Jill Ann. She's in Washington, D.C. And left a message on the speak pipe. Hi, Trip. This is Jill Ann. I'm a third year MDiv student at Wesley Theological Seminary in DC. Hi. And I learned on a recent episode of the podcast that you are a musical theater nerd. Oh, yeah. Uh, a friend of mine at seminary and I are also musical theater nerds. High quality friends. Um, musicals such as Les Mis mm-hmm. and Rent have been crucial to our theology over the years. And so we've decided we actually at some point want to write a book about the theology of different Broadway musicals. Right now we're thinking, as I said, Les Mis and Rent. Maybe also throw some Ragtime, some Wicked, maybe some Hamilton in there. So I was wondering, as a musical theater practitioner, what do you think we absolutely need to include in this book? What about the theology of musicals has been important for you? Thanks so much for listening. There you go. Nerd out with your theater out. I'm just saying that uh, that's legit. That's pretty cool. I know. Um, so, yeah, I I was a, a musical theater and philosophy double major until I found out that meant I would have to go to school for an extra year. Forever. Um, I also went to art magnet schools in Raleigh, North Carolina. So like two classes every day from probably seventh grade on was theater. And I like all of it. I like theater, musical theater. I mean, when you think about preaching and musical theater, it's sort of, it goes together very well. Don't you think? Yeah. Performative element to it. Yeah. And I love improv. Yeah. Um, Even without whiteboards, I love improv. (laughs) Uh, I, and so, you know, if I'm thinking of like how you take musical theater and then introduce it, into theological reflection. Like I liked a lot of the examples I gave. I think I would say like maybe take time before going to specific musicals to describe and help people understand and appreciate just what all is involved in putting together a musical. What is the, what is the aesthetic kind of uh, attention you need to give to a musical? Cause here's the thing, like a musical is like the scariest form of art I've ever been a part of mm. like improv comedy. There's a lot at stake. It's scary, except you trust the people with it's a game you're playing and you can get laughs by completely failing yeah. and succeeding. But when you have like a band in multiple people playing different characters and tech and lights and sound like a musical can go wrong. It's like one of those Rube Goldberg machines, you know, you, every little piece needs to be, it needs to function appropriately yeah. for the whole thing to work. And and so I, I think for people who have never been part of a musical production, um, if you played sports, the closest to a musical is like football where the – like you don't even know how to do everything, but you know what you have to rely on your other teammates yeah, to do. If they don't do it, you notice. Yeah. <laughs> like you, you notice if you're the running back that you never got past the line of scrimmage, but you can never block someone like the tackle or whatever. Like football is one of those has so many moving parts that you have to trust uh, and become ultimately vulnerable in front of a group of people. 
uh, so many that it is just so intense. Mm-hmm. The other thing about uh, theater that I find um, especially helpful if you're thinking of addressing it uh, theologically is musical theater recognizes in ways other types of theater don't um, the inherent poetics of narrative. Right, like a lot of times when you're dealing with a drama or or, or something that's not inha- a, a musical, it, you you have to communicate under the terms of normality or a genre of of of, of a theater what you're getting at. Except a musical theater, you have the permission to put into song or dance or music the experience that's driving the plot. And a lot of what happens, I think, theologically is that we are like just we read scripts and assume we understand what's happening in our faith. And to understand a musical well, you can't read the script. You have to listen to it. And to really understand the musical well, you have to be there present when all these moving parts are connected. And then all of a sudden, super cheesy love songs become powerful. Or, or, or I mean, you mentioned Rent, like to listen to Rent or to just watch it or read the script is nothing like being there uh, present. And if you, like the song, Will You Light My Fire, that whole going back and forth between uh, two people and there's multiple subtexts and you take the, the the blocking, the song, the story, and then how that relationship unpacks through it, then these moments of kind of first kind of opening erotic connection become avenues to discuss what is it like to be in a community of friends and relationships where you bring what's most vulnerable to you. And it begins often with these playful songs. And that's how most of our relationships that we have that we're vulnerable and hurt by begin with this kind of immediate. Anyway, so I I think when it goes to thinking theologically with musical theater, we need to let people in that it's not a movie, Mm -hmm. right? Like it is, it is a raw experience each time you do it. And if you, if you don't go to that place when you're performing it, then you end up failing with other people. You either don't, you don't bring it. Or you're not paying attention, you miss stuff, and so many parts there. Will, will you tell? I know you've been in. Yeah, I've been in a number, uh, a number of the the pits, you know, for for musicals, and and uh, it's it's always you never know what's going to happen. There's always an element of surprise for every performance, and no two performances are the same, and that's part of what makes it so fun and also difficult. You know, is that you can prepare. And it all kind of goes out the window when somebody misses their entrance or the prop mm-hmm. doesn't work or whatever it is, you know, and you have to be able to go with the flow and you have to be able to adjust quickly. And, and you have to know that as a musician, you have to know everyone else's parts so well so that you can find where you're supposed to be when somebody skips a line. You know what I mean? Uh, so that, I mean, I always found that challenge really fun, but I, I think that they're just to add to what you're saying. Um, the, sort of experiential aspect of religion, religious traditions, and the musical numbers. That's not something I've ever thought about before, but it makes complete sense. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's I mean, even when you're reading reading a text, reading something in in the the Bible and you see a, a passage that's offset. You know what I mean? Like it's poetry or something yeah. like that. Like I mean that's that to me is it's those moments, those experiences in a musical where somebody's is singing about whatever the feeling is or whatever mm-hmm. the you know, uh, whatever they're receiving. So I think that's really uh, powerful. But also there's a community element to it, right? I mean, like, just like with religious traditions, you have a community that you gather with to work through those those issues. I mean, musical theater communities are tight. Mm-hmm. They are, like, they have to be. Yeah. Because you were putting yourself out and you're vulnerable in front of, of strangers all the time. You know, you have to have that group of people where you, you know, can fall back on and... and and who understand you and know you and get you. So I don't know. There's a lot there. I think there's a rich and plus, you know, as a music theorist that, you know, I want to say like, Oh, well also don't just look at the text, yeah, but, yeah. Look, but look at the music too. You know, look at, look at what the music is doing to help the text along or when it doesn't help the text, you know, I mean, cause sometimes that happens too, as a way of, of making a, a, a statement Contrast or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot there. And one of the other things I was thinking of when you said that is, uh, especially for people that have never been in theater, uh, let them in on what happens when going into a scene. So if you've done your work well, whatever character you're playing, 
uh, you're aware of what just happened in that character's life, where they are emotionally, what they're bringing to each character that's in that story. Do they know them? Do they not? If they do, how's the history with them? What's on their mind? And vice versa. And that kind of being in a musical and how do you how do you communicate that uh, in, in song and the lines and the energy and all that kind of stuff uh, really gives you a non-threatening place, especially with more conservative evangelicals or, or that type, to be thinking of uh, what what is it that each person, when you're reading a sacred text, is bringing into a situation? And in in because you mentioned like plenty of text, the response is not to say anything. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an act. It's a it's it's a ritual. It's a song, and so many things. And musicals introduce, I think, into what would otherwise be some mundane stories. Yeah. Um, it opens up to us communally what it's really like on for individuals experiencing the day to day. We have these huge emotional swings. Like there are times like my daughter does like the cutest thing ever. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, the appropriate response is sunshine, lollipops and rainbows. Everything that's wonderful is what I feel when we're together. Like, and I'll start singing it to her. Elgin, my nine year old dead. Why are you singing? I was like, cause sometimes y'all just get me so excited. The appropriate thing is to sing. I don't want, why would I keep it in my head that you're worth singing about? I mean, otherwise I'd just tell you, I love you a bunch, <laughs> but when I can sing it, you know, mm. and, and, in musicals kind of, uh, you, you're in a, you're in a place where you're allowed to, to see it. Um, and even stories that, you know, outside of, uh, the musical setting, like you mentioned Les Mis, that's one that can get told multiple ways. Um, and when they do the music, the movie, Blame is of the musical version. Like, you know, mu- musicals are powerful when they let good actors do it and they can't sing. <laughs> um, so this uh, over Christmas, Alicia and I went to see Little Women. Now I've watched the movie of that too many times because Alicia watches the movie every year yeah, at Christmas. Was it too. And um, well, I'm not as big a fan of movies as I am musicals, so I really didn't like it. The book's better than the movie, but the musical was good i mean uh like characters that rolled my i would roll my eyes at in yeah. a movie uh version were the the musical version was great and it was um was at this uh, little theater in orange county and they it's like a community theater and it's wonderful so the mom in uh in, in the movie like she has multiple daughters and one of them dies um and in the third act the, the 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 other daughters are like, you know, how do you live? How do you deal with this? How do you do this stuff? And she's trying to stay strong, communicate to them. And they go off stage and then she gives, who she's a soprano, um, this monologue of a song. And uh, it's one of those, if you're in musicals, where it dodges the belt note all and you know it's setting mm. up for something. Yeah. And then she hits it. It go. She hits it crystal clear at the end, and then crackles as she starts to cry. Mm. And now I have no idea. Like it's the scariest thought to think what my life would be like and what I'd tell Elgin if Cora died. Mm. Or and I, I just know everyone in that room starts to tear up. Yeah. And you go to a place where you have these experiences, and are begin to think about it that you don't have. I mean, I don't have that if it's just, oh, someone told the yeah. story well or oh, right. I read this. or Well, I mean, I think that, that that element, the performative element of musicals is different than other mediums, movies, or even plays, really. I mean, there's something about the you – know, I'm just thinking about the similarities between a musical from the audience's perspective mm-hmm. and the relationship between those on stage and the story they're telling and the audience kind of watching it and the ritual – you know, the rituals that we do in church or in some sort of sacred space like that. It, I mean, the, it's so close in, in what you are watching, what you're witnessing, what you're asked to participate in. You know, in a lot of ways, it's like the story is unfolding that has nothing to do with you, but you are asked to be a part of it. And you can't help but respond <clears throat> to those moments uh, in it. I don't know. There's just a lot of overlap there, I think. That's pretty mm-hmm. interesting. Well, um, well, Jill and I'm interested give you some to chew on. Yeah, I well, I want to hear what y'all come up with, and m- maybe have like a top ten list, yep. the top ten best musicals, and I would put Phantom of the Opera on there, 
because Phantom has like nonstop been solid on Broadway for years. It has so many different themes you can do at different age groups. I've used that in discussion groups from like middle schoolers and stuff all the way up to adults. Uh, and it has just, you know, really beautiful songs. Um, one of the other things I would think is doing uh, a section on all the different Jesus musicals. Mm. Uh, because Jesus Christ Superstar all the way to Godspell, they're very, they're very different. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're able to compare and contrast the kind of Christological proposals of different uh, musicals, it's an opportunity to uh, learn kind of doing theological interpretation on a text that will pop out at you and grab you and move you. Cause, because, you know, if you sing an, a Christology as being interpreted in the story or an interpretation of Judas or how the power play is going on or is it what's going on the disciples, then you have to respond, mm-hmm. right? Like if you just read Matthew, you can skip over it right. or, or whatever. And um, the musicals, musicals are not entertaining if they aren't interpreting something right. and taking sides. So I love Jesus musicals for that point because – uh, somehow people don't feel obligated to say they disagree with how musical goes or they really liked one part. Mm-hmm. But if you're just, you know, reading a gospel. Or- yeah. I mean, the relationship that the audience has to the musical itself, I think, is closest to the relationship that, you know, practitioners of a religion have to their religious mm-hmm. texts. That, I mean, I don't know. I can't think of any anything else that parallels it as well. I don't know. It's really- also, just like communal singing. Yeah. I'm a fan of singing. Yeah. I like communal singing, all kinds of things when people get together to sing, and musicals are good ones. Um, and also musicals, great great for something to put on with people because the, like it's one of those group tasks you can do, and everyone will have something they can do. And, and any part goes wrong, it's bad. So um, I, before I had children, helped with like volunteer theater stuff. And there's some really cool summer programs. If you are a parent, um, in most places where you do theater in the summer and musical theater and things, and they, you don't have to sing to be integral to a musical theater, um, collection or even to sing in the chorus. Like mm. you, there's always parts in the chorus that, uh, just by not yelling, yeah, you can cooperate. And when you, when you know, to have been a part of something, with that many parts moving is always powerful. And, you know, I guess, and, you know, it's, you probably learn more than playing YouTube videos. So, so send us your pitch. Uh, yeah. Send us another uh, message with your, and we want to know 10. more top 10 musicals for, uh, that you're thinking of. And, you know, you can't not have Hamilton in it. Yeah. It's just, you have to. It's just too hit. Yeah. Even if you haven't even seen it, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you have to have Hamilton in it. You probably da- buy a stub from someone that saw it <laughs> on the internet and pretend you did. Just Instagram that. Yeah. Um, anyway. All righty. So, uh, uh, all right, DC. Now, here we go. I know. So, I, I'm just... Now, this is our third topic. We're going to talk about Peter Berger. And you, you you don't have to go with your topics yet. You tell me why, out of all the things we could talk about, you're picking this. Then I'll try to explain... Yeah, Peter Berger briefly, and then we'll talk about whatever whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. I, I I really liked this uh, sociological account of religion. So Peter Berger is a sociologist. Yes, and I, I I don't know. I liked it because it, just, especially the beginning part of it, where he he explains the where where religion comes from as a function of human biology. Mm-hmm. I thought that was really, really interesting. But it, it just it gives language to and helps understand those sort of hidden and unseen processes in our everyday life that we sort of take for granted. And it's like exposes them for what they are. And you realize all of a sudden, like, oh, my God, all that stuff that's happening that I didn't know was happening. Yeah. And it gives you good language to talk about it in a way to understand. Uh, not just religion, uh, but, you know, all sorts of institutions and structures mm-hmm. sociologically. So. Well, so, yeah, Peter Berger is a sociologist, um, and and we just finished reading The Sacred Canopy in one of the classes at the Hatchery. It's like a theories of religion class. And Peter Berger is, is pretty cool as a theorist because he's doing sociology, and he's like, I'm going to talk about religion at the group level 
as a group phenomena and which I think is, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons it's fascinating, right? It's because he's talking about religion as a group social construct and not, um, how almost everyone talks about religion. Yeah. Everyone tends to talk about religion or spirituality from their own individual experience and in by sidestepping it and even coming up with nifty nerdy ways to go, well, yeah, yeah, that's fine. It still fits in what I'm doing because here's what I'm trying to do, right? Like he forces you to like distance yourself from your own experience to then go, yeah, well, what is religion at this, Mm -hmm. at this level? And, um, he, he is part of a, a sociological school of thought called sociology of knowledge. Um, Peter Berger, uh, who was born in 1929. Um, he, he moves to the United States um, from Austria after World War II and there uh, kind of, you know, becomes a nerd. And in sociology of knowledge, uh, it, 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 it's saying that society defines and organizes itself and it organizes reality. And an individual then appropriates this reality into their own subjective consciousness, and they're like, "Yeah, this is how things are." Yeah. But the where the body of knowledge or the uh, the the knowledge of a society is in this group thing, this mm-hmm. group uh, this group knowledge. And what he wants to do is to say, like, how do we understand knowledge or what everyone just assumes is the case, mm-hmm. um, and and how does religion play a role in that? Because religion, especially until recently, he says, is uh, performing an important function. It's providing the nomos, the law, the the justifying story. Organizing structure. And, yeah, yeah. For what we call the world. And one of the things I think that's helpful that he points out is like humans, unlike other biological species, we don't come out with a whole bunch of instincts, right? Like a little turtle cracks. We're half done. Yeah. We're half done. We need yeah. another nine months. We got to cook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you know, like a little turtle comes out and it's a sea turtle. It's like, I go swimming. Just keep swimming. And it goes down and just takes off into whatever sea turtles do, got instincts. A baby comes out and it does nothing but scream. It can't feed itself. It can't protect itself. It can't even open its eyes for a while. I mean, like, it's not even going to start eating unless. Most mammals can start walking, like, within minutes, if, you know, hours, minutes after being I saw, born. like, I, I saw a two month old giraffe. It ran. Yeah. I've seen a two month old kid. <laughs> It poops on you. That's all it does. <laughs> yeah. So so what he's saying is like, um, you know, we don't come out with the ability to survive. We don't come out with all these instincts um, built in for us. So in order to survive, we need a collective and we also need collective knowledge or learning that not just through our DNA and instincts and stuff do you get the ability to live. You get it passed down at this social communal uh, level that – when you're born into a world, you're also born into a nomos, a law, or a sacred canopy. That you're born, and you're not just given DNA and 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 uh, you're ready to rock. You're given a language, which includes in it unacknowledged determinations that shape the world you're in, and that knowledge is taught by others when you interact, and that an individual, he says, and and this is one of the things I always find helpful about Peter Berger is he's like, you don't got to don't lose your, lose, you know, lose all your candy on this. Like this is, this is a, this is just real. Like yeah. an individual can't, cannot um, construct all the knowledge they need to live. Like we take Advil. We don't know why it works. Yeah. Like, I mean, if you start to think, I, through, I think about that all the time. Like who first figured out that this plant was okay to eat in this one? What really, really wasn't. And we don't know their names. But no, thank you. But we know that now. Bad choice. Bad choice, dude. Number four. <laughs> we respect you. <laughs> but yeah, because that we as a as a species, like we get handed this world and we're we're socialized into it, but we can never actually know everything. We act as if we know, right? You, if you decided, I'm only going to believe the truth. You know, I've thought through experience and understood myself. You would go crazy. Like you like you just can't. Yeah. I mean, Aristotle probably got as close as it gets, and he didn't even get there. And now you it's just impossible. So to me, like that we as individuals are a part of this body of knowledge that human beings have. Um, that it's socialized into us through interaction, and that the individuals then pass on this body of knowledge to others 
is in one sense, I think a lot of our contemporary kind of postmodern critiques, you're like, yeah, uh, that's just like the system or whatnot. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, yeah, it is. And it has bad stuff in it. But it's also the system yeah. that we kind of have to have. And e- even to in- understand the critiques, which Peter Berger wants to point out. Yeah. Has to, it's on the terms of the law. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And, because we have so internalized the structure in mm-hmm. our mind that that's how we, we just think that way. Yeah, it comes with what rebellion looks like. Yeah. And so the knowledge then exists not at the individual level. You can have all sorts of different conclusions. But knowledge exists at the community level. This uh, body of knowledge, and it's constructed, it's maintained, and it moves through um, – at that social level and it's there that you can see change and growth and development and such but uh and you can even see it deteriorate and morph right like because he tells the big story of how things have changed over time mm-hmm. but when he when he gets to religion what i think is helpful is he goes yeah religion for almost everything we know about has all constantly been this all-encompassing body of knowledge in society and it provides, when you're born into it and you come to know it, uh, a, a worldview. Um, and and so then he pauses to describe it, what that process is like for the individual in the world. And in there, the, the, th- the three parts that – and I would say like I'll describe them, but think about it makes sense, yeah. right? Like yeah. it's just descriptive of what happens – and a descriptive account from a sociologist is unrelated to the veracity claims that anyone's thinking, right? So just because he describes how this process works from a sociological perspective, it doesn't mean something is true or not true. You don't have to, like, raise your guard up. Just the descriptive part is, first, it's the first move is externalization in which people project their conception of the world out into the world. So you have a vision of the world. You project it. You externalize it out in the world. And then you you have a process called objectification in which this projected conception is called reality. The, you you create a construct in your head, put it out, project it out in the world. Then you go, ha, it's that's, real. that's reality. It's now an object. And then this objective reality is reappropriated into the mind of the individual as reality. And so we've all had the experience growing up where this process of externalizing – and objectifying, which happens with people not knowing it at all, is then handed to us as an object. We we then internalize it and pass it on. And so the individual doesn't experience the process consciously. We are thrown into it, raised, we internalize it, and it might more for change. Our relationship to it could change and stuff over time. Um, but the law, the, the the this construction of reality just, just sits there. Mm-hmm. I, I think what's what I'm really interested in, especially when he talks about it in the book, is well, one that that those constructions are tenuous and are always mm-hmm. in threat, and so they have to be continually legitimated by you know whatever all this, the institutions and, and things that we have. You know, we need to, to keep making them viable and plausible for yeah. us to With the plausibility structures, yeah, yeah. and and they happen in lots of direct and indirect ways. Where, oh, education system are in, in media, what books you read or don't read and what interpretations are celebrated and which ones yeah. are ignored. Yeah. But because like it's, it's, it's always, uh, needing to be, uh, defended. Like I think what's interesting is to think about what happens when it starts to break down. What happens when this organizing principle of the, this, of society starts to crack and we can start to see through, um, on the other, like the chaos on the other side. Um, mm-hmm. and, and that's really why I wanted to talk about it because I feel like that's sort of, you know, he talks in the end of the book about, you know, uh, how religion is sort of declining and, you know, secularization is, is happening. And so now religion is, is no longer, uh, plausible as an organizing principle or structure, but that the government sort of takes and the economy has taken over that yeah, yeah. role. And so now religion is just a private individual thing, no longer the social construction. Whether or not that's actually true, I think what's interesting to think about is the state we're in right now, 
because it almost sort of feels like the even that the economic and the the uh, governmental institutions are starting to crack, and like what is going to take over when that happens? If Steve Bannon and yeah, know, yeah, you so, know what I mean? Like, yeah, so like he talks about the plausibility structures, the that like what of. You know, like if 80% of reality is like this is real, mm-hmm. then the other 20% is helping us out. It lets you get your steam out. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and you probably peep, – okay, here's one. People probably experience this. If you listen to this podcast, you're probably the person who like when you're in youth group or college or whatever in your small group asked a question that everyone else rolled their eyes at and the youth minister's like, well, we'll talk about that later or whatever. But if you had said um, uh, the virgin conception is just kind of nuts <laughs> and everyone had said – yeah, I agree yeah, with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That then you would have got a completely different response from the minister. Yes. Right? Because the percentage change. Like if there's two or three in a big group, they're like, that's nice. You we'll handle that. You're yeah, no yeah. threat. But once there's enough little uh critical mass. No moy. Yeah. You which go. is what he calls them. The but, plural of it. Yeah, yeah. You know, alternatives, mm-hmm. uh structures, then 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 it's not that what what the law is it isn't coherent internally. Is it it's a construction. Yeah. The the fear is that once there are other plausible things, once the uh, mythology is acknowledged as a human construct, mm-hmm. it's not the it, it, it it's it's the fear that comes in. Yeah. Right. Uh, Catherine Keller, and she was on the podcast, said um, that deconstruction is the recognition that it is all constructions, but it's also an invitation to keep constructing beautifully. Mm-hmm. And in in that that is someone who's okay with the, this big fear. But most people I don't think are. No. Right? right? So they would rather protect uh, the security blanket mm-hmm. the law or nomos or their reality has by getting people out to ask the wrong questions yep. or by uh, um, creating a hole in the system where you can sit there and disagree with it, but you can disagree mm-hmm. with it. You know, like here's where you protest. Now don't protest yeah, yeah, here. Don't protest and as here. long as you don't do it this way, it, you need us to arrest somebody. We'll do it, right? And the system has yeah. all these rules. Um, and 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 that's all. It's all well and good till you have someone that's in charge of it who doesn't follow who any wants of to, them. Like throw down the whole system, or yeah. tear down the whole system, and then people freak out. Right, right, right. right. And so I, I guess that's is that what the, I'm, the 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 like the the fact that you regularly hear this is not proper decorum. Right, 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 <laughs> right, right. And you're like, hey, hey, hey. Uh, can we go back to George W. Bush? <laughs> All the things he did that really freaked us out, he lied about and covered up. So the mythology was there, yep. even though all sorts of other horrible exactly. things might have happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, bad. and the Democrats, you know, are like, and then Republicans are like, yeah, I mean, like, we didn't really agree with Obama, but at least, I mean, he, you know, it, he, he played by the rules. He played by the rules. Can we get the rules back? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm curious what you think, like, if, if the, the, uh, nomos of the the government the federal government in this country starts to well this would be liberal democracies i think is the big threat today like right like yeah yeah what's going to take over what what new plausibility structure is going to the scariest thing is that the germans are the ones holding down liberal democracies right now yeah yeah i've seen so many articles like uh Angela Merkel is now the leader of the free world sort of thing no i just you know you're sitting there going like a handshake you can't even do a handshake (laughs) Like what is this about? Like, like uh, you, you can shake hands with a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, he's, he's germ phobic, and yeah. he just has no idea what what's on uh, German German hands. Yeah, that must be it. The germs on powerful ladies from. from I, I like your hands. response though, which was that he's just not used to grabbing women by the hands. Yeah, yeah, the firm that- firm handshake. <laughs> um, so the the one of the things that Berger points out that I think is helpful for this is. Uh, it, he gives a sociological account of theodicies, yeah, right? Where yeah. uh, a theodicy is the ways in which a nomos accounts for counter evidence. And so, you know, he gives the example like Israelites, they're in Babylonian captivity and they aren't like your God lost a battle or your God's not true. It's, um, you know why you're taking, you're breaking God's covenant. That's what you get for taxing poor people on the Sabbath <laughs> exile. Um, or uh, you you have uh, uh, theodicies of you know all different sorts like oh death is horrible mm-hmm. you know like that isn't one of those questions all different religions get stuck yeah. answering well a, a really common popular one is oh well it, everything happens for a reason oh. but that's what that's how it functions yeah 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 it, where where you look at the world and go you can't call this 
the product of one good God. So, yes, you can. <laughs> if you just read this verse this way yep. and add quantum physics, then clearly God <laughs> meant this for good and you don't know it yet. Yeah. But, um, it, and, and it, you turn horrible things into being the result of where we're culpable, right? Mm-hmm. Like, um, it, someone is, uh, is a victim of abuse or whatever. And you, you regularly hear stories where people are like, yeah, religious persons then are asking you about what, what, what did you contribute or whatever? Or, oh, horrible. Like when people are like, well, I know she got raped, but she had on a short dress. Or yeah. Whatever, oh where, God. you know, you can't just go like, why the hell does this happen? This is horrible and bad. There's you some like, sense of it. You, to make sense of it, you have to give it meaning. Yeah. And, um, and you have these stories. As long as there's still meaning in it, then the, then the truth regime can stay intact. Mm-hmm. But now it's like in the, in light of our kind of ongoing growth of critical consciousness, all of a sudden Trump makes the people that have not been very good at, uh, at going, yay, democratic nation states, maybe the more progressive people go like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> um, we were, we were, I, yeah, we were still going to stick to the system. We got prophetic <laughs> critiques, but, we need the system there to stick it to. Exactly. And, and, uh, and now you're going to make it, you're going to make me say nice stuff about uh, democratic norms. <laughs> <laughs> and so I definitely think that is a, uh, an experience a lot of people uh, are doing, like where you see people from both parties and Americans of all sorts, like go, what do we have to do to not? Yeah. Like we can't. Uh, how much of this do we want to acknowledge? Yeah, which is funny because during the election, how many of them were saying things like, "Oh, well, you know, hopefully the system will break down because it's so corrupt and so bad." You know, like democracy, liberal democracy is evil. Evil. You know, we need, you know, Bernie Sanders socialism, all that stuff. So the system should break down. And now, as soon as it starts, everyone's like, "Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute." I, I take that back. Never mind. It's too scary. And and one of the things that I okay so. One of the things Berger talks about with Christianity and monotheisms in general is that the theodicy set up the conditions where they undermine themselves, mm-hmm. right? So in the early modern period, we develop natural theologies, uh, deism, these type of things where we go, look, we're learning about science and stuff. We got a nice ordered universe. It's like a clock. Clock means it's a clockmaker. And this is like a common argument. And the next thing you have uh, Darwin. Mm-hmm. It's like, yep. Call your uncle up. He's an ape, you know, <laughs> and then that sets up for uh, the it, the theodicies create a support, you know, a little pillar under that nomos that everyone then starts like, look at that pillar. Yeah. That's awesome. Then you get new evidence and it screws that pillar up. And and so I wonder if there's not like a similar thing happening where, you know, the the logic the stories we tell ourselves about American democracy mm-hmm. and the continued justifications of it have set up for, um, like the very system, you know, that we have right now, right? Like we have, we, we have this like kind of the myth of voting mm-hmm. and we have, we've inherited, uh, an electoral college, the way the Senate is everyone gets two senators. We got a bunch of congressmen. We have um, this relationship between like federal and state and local. Like there's so many different – that there's like mythologies around it. Mm-hmm. And so we just assume we can't even tinker with it because yeah. part of being an American democracy is this, oh, we have experiments in the state and blah, 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 blah. Well, what experiments we had were uh, small – uh, smaller red states had a lot of money poured into it after Citizens United mm-hmm. by a few very rich conservative people, and they took it over gerrymandered, yep. and then um, w- went on. And, um, and then we've also been having uh, continued uh, a m- marketing and cultivating of our anxieties that polarize us, mm-hmm. and they've been monetized very well. And then you have someone who who's who is the emblem of. Of free market capitalism, and he has a stinking reality show where you know he's like a TV preacher for Mammon, yeah, like and yeah. and so I don't I'm, I know if you live on a coast and don't have family and fly over country or visit it regularly, this is going to sound weird, but they like really <laughs> believe that he was a really good business person, and um and you know that. That like the apprentice and this type of stuff is like oh this is what we really need because what have Americans always said like. 
oh, we got democracy over here and we got capitalism over here and we, we got capitalism of the conscience in the United States because Jesus helps. Yep. And, and he just, like he's just playing that group and then saying horrible things. Like, and, and it, it leaves you not trusting any of it. Mm-hmm. Right. But the, like, I don't know. I feel like if you were trying to script someone mm-hmm. to perform like the truth, of a bunch of ideologies that are destructive, he's doing it. Yeah. You know, and, and that freaks us out mm-hmm. because, um, we're like, oh, oh no. Like, he, like he's going for it. This is like what you, you, you just aren't expecting. Yeah. And he's just doing it. Well, it, well, the, it's like you can't believe that it's happening because you never thought it was possible. Like, he said he was going to do everything that he is doing. And we're like, nah, it's never good. Nobody's going to vote him in. Like, don't worry about it. It's, he's too crazy. He's too extreme. Like, whatever. It'll never happen. And now it's happening. And we're like, what the hell? And and I think the other side of it that, um, and, and not that I really, I don't really know what to do with it. I'm not even sure this is this part's connected to Peter Berger, but um, that in, well, I guess it kind of is that. I mean, he talks about when you get to a point where there's a plurality, yes, of nomos laws, yeah, then, um, fear. Of there being another version mm-hmm. next to you, mm-hmm. right? Like you, you have an option when you are on a street with six religions. Yeah. It relativizes your own law. That's one. You accommodate the fact that there are Buddhists that are not atheist or like there are real Buddhists, there's real atheists, and there's real Hindus and Jews, and they aren't horrible people going to kill babies, right? Like yeah. once you realize – and they could be nicer than you. You have to accommodate that in a structure – where most religions were the only game in town for a long time. Yep. So that means you either have to be like that organizing structure right there. That's one. Mm-hmm. This is another one. But we can hang out on weekends and in the voting booth and when we're paying. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like you either do that or you have what he calls an ideological closure. Mm-hmm. And then you you battle out your ideology over others. Yeah. Now, I think the reason that 37% that still thinks Trump's doing a good job and that high still. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, the, and there's like no flinching. Yeah. And the logic for doing all this stuff is the, the, their, their story they tell themselves requires there not being another plausibility structure right. that's viable. Right. And that story got threatened and anxious and overwhelmed because the rest of us more progressive people we're like there's a bunch of stories and we don't care yeah, yeah. what you think you backwards redneck blah 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 you're gonna like it or you're gonna shut up about it mm-hmm. and they did until they went to the voting booth yep. and and if you a lot of the stories i've been reading that do interviews with trump voters like they all have the there's some thing they'll pick their one thing yeah. it's like oh bathroom walls mm-hmm. and you're like this is like really but in your head, if you're just a, a more progressive person, you're like, you, you, you voted for that? Yeah. Right. Or, oh, the Supreme Court pick because of abortion. But yeah. And they're like, I, I know he's a morally depraved person. And but yes, abortion. he has given money, uh, to women to have abortions. And I'm, I'm, I guess I have to admit that. Um, and yeah, maybe statistically abortions went down under Clinton and then uh, down even more under Obama. But, uh, I'm, I only want, my side to get everything they want, which is namely like yeah, yeah. you can and you hear it. And so but so I think one of the things that um, when you understand that the anxiety emerging out of those people isn't um, and us, I think by by having much people, you're like, oh, my God, yeah. you exist. Yeah. I have to admit it now. Yeah. Um, it, when you realize how this at uh, the macro, the individual could be wonderful or bad. And mm-hmm. I, you regularly hear people say that like, right, right. right. She's like the nicest person. Yeah. Like blah blah blah. How would she vote for? Insert the other party you don't like. Um, but when Berger helps you realize that a lot of what we want to attribute to the individual is a collective decision to avoid meaninglessness and chaos and fear and and control our anxiety. And so you have this weird allegiance to that structure. Yeah. And you all, it's easy to spot it in someone else. Right, right, right. And then it usually comes out of your mouth. Basically, what your structure says about that structure, mm-hmm. and then it gets it gets in this cl- problematic area, and you could tell it's getting worse when um, there was recent data on kind of like that now there's like no middle in either party, yeah, and that it's a problematic to get caught hanging out with each other and stuff like that because we, we like those are the enforcement things that create problems. 
Now, you, the, I'm saying this as someone who's probably so far left that I don't like. I mean, I've hung out with conservative people, but like I could not imagine hanging out to the point we make really important compromises. Except that if that was our job, right? Like, it, it, yeah. like, <laughs> the, it, like I, it, like in my head, I would be like, all right. As long as we don't screw up the crap that's going to have us not be able to breathe later, like right. like I I I could compromise on a lot of things to to like save the planet. Sure, and sure. and this is just a straight up numerical issue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but if your if your world is in a place where you can't, and this is what liberals do, you you are just doing violence to me unless you recognize mm-hmm. me on the terms I want recognized which are a whole bunch of things that if you recognize it as a, in another plausibility structure are threats to your, your identity. Yeah, right. And so you experience the, the, the desire for recognition, recognition from someone else as, as a, as like throwing huge amounts of judgment on you. Yeah. And I don't know what you do about that. I just know that Peter Berger kind of like goes like, yep, that's going to happen. <laughs> and, um, the, the other thing I thought of out of this was that Atlantic article that said, like, if you're conservative and don't go to church, you're the worst. So we need more <laughs> to go to church. The ones that are the most racist, most alt-right and all that kind of stuff, those are the ones that don't go to church. So that's, that's, I'm not surprised. And, um, and so, so, you know, like, um, if you, if you're, if you're down for the spiral, I mean, I'm pretty <laughs> sure that, you know, uh, um, collective worship and things are uh, blooming yeah uh, they're communitarian endeavors in which um you postulate a sacred canopy and narrative that includes all those people present even if that is a little bit more different than at your local alt-right gathering <laughs> is apparently uh, good for <laughs> communities well-being go figure um and in in all right very red meme yeah red meme yes bad red meme mm-hmm. we're not talking about football red meme we're we're talking about worse a lot worse um yeah, well, um, that, that was, was fun. Yeah, well, you know, um, we guess we should say at the very end, Peter Berger and uh, the Sacred Canopy uh, was an active uh, proponent of the secularization thesis, mm-hmm. which is like the more science and stuff takes place, more plural pluralism goes around. Eventually, religion is just going to die. And then he revised that later and said, all right, I guess not. Um, he wrote a book after it called a rumor of angels, mm. a rumor of angels. And Nathan, when he heard that said, it sounds he, like some new agey kind of thing. I'm not, you know, I, I, are there crystals involved. Well, the subtitle is modern society and the rediscovery of the supernatural. But, um, <laughs> well, you, you, as long as you don't have to like, does it come with a, f- a free crystal with every purchase? Crystal chakras and buddy. Jesus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that's, uh, <laughs> that's a new stuff. No, I'm, I'm sure it's a great book. I just, the title is a little weird. <laughs> Yeah. Well, um, you know, if y'all have a major uh, field defining text that you would like <laughs> Nathan to rename, um, <laughs> just let me know. I, let I, know. I, I'm pretty good at the, that. So. The uh, the level of uh, a confidence he has in his uh, renaming abilities is significant. So, um, yeah. So anyway, this is uh, Old Christianity Theology Nerd Podcast. And now we're going to... We're going to rock out. Say bye, because Trey's going to sing to us for a second. Peace.